in um, running through today's presentation. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. And uh, let's hope that it will be an easier one uh, than 2020. Um, so, as Charlie said, uh, today I'll uh, walk you through our perspective of um, marine crew transfer when it comes to deep water operations and FPSOs. Um, the deep water operations and FPSOs is one of our best market segments, um, and we have almost 20 years of experience uh, in deep water operations and uh then uh just over 10 um 10 years of experience sorry 15 years of experience in the fpsos um so i will try to share some of our perspectives um and then leave you um leave you with information um to make your own decisions uh towards the end uh we will share some of the materials during the presentation and i will also um let you know uh, where you can find additional reading materials if you are interested. So when we are talking about deep water and FPSO operations, the obvious question is what are the main issues in those types of operations? Um, so what are the company's experiences as main challenges? Um, and we have to uh, try and understand uh, the potential sources of risks. Um, so summarizing them in, in some kind of um, infographics, those would be weather and sea conditions, uh, internal processes, uh, location, so where the operation is taking place, uh, people as a resource, and then the equipment what kind of uh, equipment is, is used and how that equipment is maintained. So if we try to cluster these, uh, we end up with location, exposure and cost. And how do these, um, how do these pan out? So location, um, we are talking about distance from shore. Of course, deep water operations in most cases uh, can be quite far away from shore, uh, sometimes over a thousand kilometers uh, away from shore, which makes um, which makes it challenging to have crew changes uh, when people are on rotation. Also, uh, getting supplies uh, to the field and uh, an important factor getting replacement parts and technicians who are doing maintenance uh, or particular maintenance to the field. It also makes it more challenging um, in case of uh, an emergency situation or um, um, the need to, to evacuate people uh, who are either uh, sick or have been injured. Uh, so the distance from shore makes that quite challenging. Weather conditions would be the second one, uh, which are tied to location. Whether we are talking about uh, sea states or wind conditions, uh, they would depend on how far away from shore the operation is. So, of course, the further uh, away, the more exposed you are because there is nothing out there on the ocean to give you a natural protection from weather conditions. And then regional particularities. Um, there are certain regions and certain countries which have <clears throat> their own particularities, uh, particularly on a country level in terms of required certification that you need to have for your vessels or crew or the equipment that is used aboard your vessel or a platform, and that makes it that can make things uh, sometimes challenging. I think Brazil might be a good example of that um, when the particular type of uh, certifications are required for both people and equipment. Uh, this uh, this map is showing us roughly. Uh, 
areas when we are looking at a global at the global picture areas where we have both deep water and fpso operations so of course they're not always um, matching but in in most cases uh, in regions where you have deep water operation you would have an fpso uh, operations too so um, looking at the right hand side we have asia pacific so new zealand australia and then southeast asia uh, then there is africa both with west coast uh, quite familiar in the fpso world uh, and also with uh, deep water and ultra deep water operations there and the east coast uh, popular topic uh, in recent months and years we have up there north sea and uh, northern part of Norway, uh, almost going to Barents Sea there, and then we have uh, across the ocean Canada, and moving down Gulf of Mexico, of course, uh, with deep water operations over there, and then the South America, I've already touched on, on Brazil. Um, in terms of how do we cover those areas, uh, we have been involved, so given the extent of years that we have been supporting companies in those areas. We do have quite good coverage. If we take a look at the North Sea, for example, uh, we have over 300 units operating offshore North Sea uh, today in, in different countries. So in different countries, waters, and we have been working and we are still working and supporting uh, all super majors operating uh, not just in the North Sea, but in other parts of the world as well. So Shell, Chevron, BP, Equinor, uh, ENI, um, ConocoPhillips, uh, and then we have companies like Premier Oil, Dana Petroleum, Acre BP, um, and many others. Um, in West Africa, uh, on the West Coast in particular, uh, almost every FPSO operating there has at least one of our units on board and I'll try to explain uh, when and how they're using them and how that helps them to increase the operating envelope uh, for the operations that they're having. Um, going to the left side of the map, um, particularly when we are talking about Brazil, uh, every FPSO operating there at the moment has at least one uh, frog on board um, and of course up there in Canada uh, quite a few units uh, there operating in deep water offshore uh, Canada on the Atlantic side. This map is uh, summarizing similar thing but focusing on FPSO vessels. And then on the left-hand side, you have the, uh, the number of vessels um, in each country. Uh, so if we are uh, focusing on location, but um, not just by region, but by country, and the largest number of FPSOs currently in uh, Brazil, then we have UK, Angola, China, Nigeria, Australia, and so on. Um, and as I mentioned, we have uh, quite a lot of units operating in all of those areas. Um, in terms of our coverage for FPSOs, um, we have more than 50% of FPSOs are uh, today using uh, our products either as contingency or for routine uh, operation and for routine transfer of their crew. Um, and I'll try to explain how does that help um, help them uh, with their operations. So we have uh, 170 units aboard on 90 FPSO vessels uh, across the world. Exposure. So um, if we go back to the beginning of the presentation, uh, we had location, exposure, and cost. And location, um, I just walked through, and now we are on exposure. So what does, how can we be exposed, and what are our exposure risks when we are operating offshore um, or in deep water? Ease of access, how easy it is to access the field, 
and then how easy it is to move around that field and to move people and supplies and parts um, and anything else that is uh, needed for day-to-day -day operations, how easy it is to access those things and to move them. Safety always ranks very high um, when we are talking about offshore operations of any kind, but particularly um, for deep water and FPSO operations because of their location. Uh, because if anything goes wrong, it is extremely challenging to get to the shore or, or can take quite a long time. Contingency, um, what, are our, what is our plan B? If anything goes wrong uh, with any part of the operation, what is plan B? So contingency is quite an important part of a puzzle here. The equipment, uh, what equipment is used, how it is used, how it is stored, how easy it is to uh, maintain it, how, what is the ownership experience, uh, what is the cost uh, for all that. Uh, so how can we keep the cost down uh, considering the location um, and the exposure uh, that I just uh, talked about, and then maintenance in the end. And then we get to cost. So both location, uh, it was visible through these slides that both location and exposure can have uh, quite a significant impact on our costs. There are some other variables that can impact our costs as well. Like what is the operating envelope in that particular field or on our particular um, platform or FPSO? What is the downtime uh, and how do they impact productivity? So how can we increase the operating envelope? How can we uh, uh, keep downtime to a minimum? And how can we make sure that we meet those productivity targets and we deliver and have the output that is required uh, from us. In order to understand that a little bit better, we put together these infographics, which summarizes some of the some of the basic questions or some of the basic um, things that um, every one of us is considering when we are making decisions and when we are looking at the operations offshore, particularly ones in deep water and with FPSOs. So we are trying to stay ahead with operational uh, efficiency. Um, I mentioned uh, the operational envelope and downtime. We are monitoring our performance and trying to improve um, uh, both on the cost side by saving cost and on the performance side by increasing performance. All that requires constant planning. So constant planning and revision of plans and planning and revision of plans. It also requires us to be realistic. So to understand what can actually be done and what can be achieved under certain circumstances uh, so that the plans are realistic and we don't end up uh, trying to mitigate uh, badly construct constructed plans. Uh, in order for us to be realistic, we have to understand what we are dealing with and what we are talking about. And oftentimes that requires some homework uh, for us to do. Uh, we have to try and be comfortable with the risk. It's not always easy. Uh, I think this past year uh, was a good example of that. Um, but the more comfortable we become with the risks, the easier it is to handle them and to mitigate them in the, in the right way. We have to understand the level of detail we should address and which details we should focus on and which ones uh, we can uh, move over um, uh, because they are not as significant. So understanding details sometimes can be quite important. And then in the end, always go back to basics. Uh, usually a solution can be quite simple um, if we just dissect things in the right way and try to look at them patiently and calmly. So going back to the beginning and the cover page of the, of the presentation, 
and the topic of the presentation, so crew transfer. How can, uh, how can we use crew transfer to help the operations we have offshore in deep water or on FPSO um, mitigate uh, different risks that are connected with location and with exposure? Uh, so all those things that I uh, just talked about, how can crew transfer help with that? And what are we actually looking for when we are talking uh, about crew transfer? So most companies, when they are thinking about their operations and moving people uh, from shore to the field and then uh, inside the field, uh, so interfield transfer, they want to have uh, flexibility. So they want to be able to move people um, freely and flexibly uh, without too much time being spent on planning each single move. Of course, with deep water operations, the, um, the methods of transfer that companies are using for people are usually, uh, usually in, involve helicopters to getting people from the shore to the field. In uh, a lot of cases, they can involve marine transfer, so getting people on speed boats uh, and on cruiser type vessels from the shore to the, to the vessel, and then uh, getting them from a vessel to an FPSO or to a platform by crane. Uh, some companies are using uh, gangways um, like Ampleman for interfield transfers. So they wouldn't use Ampleman to get people um, from the shore to the field, but they would use Ampleman to get people um, uh, from a vessel to a platform or to an FPSO on the field. And both of these methods of transfer fit really well with the narrative for deep water operations and for, um, uh, and for FPSOs. They do have a couple of things that are easy to mitigate if you look at them closely. Uh, so both these methods of transfer can be quite expensive, both the helicopters and, and gangways. Uh, they can also have quite particular requirements in terms of what type of vessel can you use uh, if you are using a gangway. The gangway won't fit to any type of, su of supply vessel or support vessel, and the vessel has to have certain, has to meet certain requirements and comply with certain spec in, in order to be able to support the gangway. With helicopters, the weather can often be a challenge. Uh, high wind, low visibility, or both, uh, they can be quite challenging. However, there are parts of the day uh, when these methods of transfer work really well. And then we get to the point where we are uh, looking at the operating envelope. So can we add an additional method of transfer here into the mix and uh, use it to increase the operating envelope um, in deep water operations? So our products would be one of those options. They would help you increase the operating envelope and be able to transfer people for longer, particularly in situations where there is low visibility at dusk, in, uh, at dawn, um, in foggy areas like offshore Canada, uh, in areas where um, the visibility can be uh, for a very short period of time, like North Sea during winter. And then uh, when the operational envelope for either helicopter or a gangway is for whatever reason uh, shortened. Um, the frog can then help extend the operating envelope uh, for the whole field. Uh, safety, uh, in terms of safe uh, tra safety track record, uh, frog um, option ranks the highest. Uh, so we've had now 10 years without the lost time incidents, uh, and we have over um, 1,300 units operating offshore um, every day. Convertibility, so what do we mean here? 
how easy it is to convert the method of transfer you are using to Medivac option or to, um, uh, to be able to use it uh, for emergency e evacuation. Of course, helicopters are easy to convert. You just slide the stretcher on the floor of a helicopter if the helicopter size is, is uh, big enough, and that solves the problem. With gangways, um, you would walk uh, with the stretcher um, uh, uh, across the gangway in, in the same way that you would walk when you, you don't have a stretcher. However, in cases of low visibility um, or smoke or both, um, you would, uh, or any other condition that would uh, jeopardize or impede the use of helicopters or gangways, uh, frogs can be easily converted to a medevac mode, and I'll talk about that in, in uh, just a second. And then how easy it is to use this method of, of transfer. Uh, with helicopters, uh, unless they are on a helipad, uh, you would need to wait uh, for them to get from the shore to the, uh, to, to the field. Sometimes that can be a challenge um, if they don't get clearance or if they're waiting for clearance or if there is anything uh, too challenging with the weather conditions and they're struggling to take off. The same would go for gangway. So while they, uh, they can be left on a vessel um, uh, for the duration, sometimes um, if you have to install them uh, quickly, sometimes that is not possible. Uh, with frog, it takes a couple of minutes, uh, literally, to put the frog in, in uh, use when it's stored on a deck of a vessel or um, or a platform. In, and in that sense, it gives you flexibility as a contingency option next to the methods of transfer you already have uh, to be able to move your people quickly uh, if there is an emergency. And then cost, I've already mentioned, uh, the downside oftentimes for helicopters and gangways can be the cost side of things. In that sense, uh, frog is, frogs are extremely cost effective. They have lifespan of uh, 10 years or more. Um, and in that sense, the cost um, required to, to purchase them uh, is minimal. Um, and there is also an option to rent them uh, for a specific period of time rather than buy them if that's more convenient for the operation. Um, further to, to the unit itself, so further to, to uh, frogs themselves, we uh, do offer full scope support from risk analysis and planning when you're trying to make a decision whether this is actually going to help you improve the operating envelope or lower cost or both. Um, by, uh, by providing crew training and supporting materials, uh, by uh, providing servicing and replacement parts worldwide, regardless whether it's onshore or offshore, uh, by helping you with marine crew transfer implementation, so by commissioning the unit, uh, offering operational support worldwide, so once you are using the product, if you have any doubts whether you should proceed or if you find yourself in a specific situation operationally, um, you can always come to us and say the heave of a vessel is X and I'm trying to figure out whether it is safe to, uh, to do the lift or not or what should be the angle uh, for something. And our engineering and operational support team uh, would provide you with answers. And then I've mentioned rentals, uh, rental packages already. So let me quickly walk you through the product itself. So here we have the XT range, Frog XT. XT stands for extreme uh, performance, so uh, Frog Extreme. Uh, it means that it's suitable for any weather condition and any type of, um, of sea state. Uh, up front, there is Frog XT10, a 10 passenger unit. Then we have Frog XT6, six passenger unit, and uh, finally XT4. Uh, for four people. So here you have 
uh, sort of all three products uh, in in a lineup, um, and you can see that they are very modular. So even if you have a mixed fleet, a fleet of you have one a four passenger and one ten passenger, for example, the replacement parts are matching um, in about eighty percent of uh, cases so we try to make them as modular as possible uh, going to um, the uh, operating envelope of the xt range this is a summary that applies to all three products so they're operational in up to four meters significant wave height up to 40 knots of wind um, uh, very well uh, behaved in temperatures from minus 40 to plus 50, uh, both in arid and tropical climate uh, and uh, humid climate. Uh, they respond very well. Uh, they float and self right um, and they have shock absorbing feet, suspension system uh, and protection from vertical and lateral impact, which I will walk you through in just a second. Charlie will, sh uh, will share in the chat box a link to a testing video, which you can see after the presentation, uh, after the webinar. I didn't want to use much of the time uh, because we are trying to keep the webinar down to an hour. Um, it's, um, so the link will show you how we are testing the product um, in our development center. So, Going back to XT10, so this again is Frog XT10. You've seen it on the on on the picture uh, just a second ago. Uh, here you can see the inside of the unit, uh, and you can see how seats are uh, spaced out and uh, how much space there is inside of the unit. So you can see that it's quite spacious, and people are quite protected uh, inside, and you can get a feel uh, of the unit itself. Here is a bird's view of the unit. It's, it's, uh, it's a render, not a real unit. Uh, this was easier for presentation purposes to show you when it's converted to a medevac mode. How does it look? So it fits two stretchers at the same time and one paramedic uh, can go uh, with injured uh, people. Uh, this one is XT4, so here again we can see the stretcher mode uh, when it's converted to a medevac option. Uh, you can see one injured person and one paramedic seated over there on the left. Uh, the conversion to stretcher mode uh, takes a couple of minutes. It's very similar to lowering the seats in your car and then uh, sliding the stretcher on top of the, um, the seat that has been lowered, uh, there is a lock that allows you to lock the stretcher in, in a position. Uh, and basically that's it. Um, the injured person can then be uh, transferred to a safe location or to, um, to medical attention. Uh, so it's very quick to convert the unit to a medevac mode. The lift itself um, it takes about five minutes. So the, pre the preparation and then the lift itself, uh, moving the unit by crane from a vessel to a, to a platform or uh, the other way around, it takes about five minutes. And if we say uh, that it takes, let's say, five minutes to convert this to medevac mode, so we are talking about very quick response time uh, for emergency situation then and the uh, evacuation of, of your personnel. Here again, we have XT, Frog XT4. So here you can see clearly how seats have been lowered and uh, the stretcher is locked in a position. And you can see uh, the position of paramedic uh, that goes together with injured person. Um, and you can see how much space there is in the unit and how it, what's the feel uh, for both of them being transferred to safety. Um, this image shows us um, 
a landed frog uh, XT4 and XT6, they are exactly the same size from the outside when they're on a deck of a vessel. Um, the idea is to show um, the how much space does it take uh, because oftentimes space is at premium uh, and a lot of operators and their subcontractors are concerned about space, particularly on a support vessel, offshore uh, supply vessels. Uh, they're uh, asking what is the footprint and uh, how much space is, is needed. Um, so Charlie will share in the chat box uh, user manuals for um, XT6 and XT10, uh, Frog XT6 and uh, Frog XT10. And I think he also have, uh, I'm not sure, Charlie, if we have the comparison document, if we can share that too, uh, if it's available. Um, in, the comp in the product comparison document that Charlie just shared, in the, in the hands out uh, tab, uh, you will see, so it's a two pager and you will be able to see um, the, the landing area required and the storing area, so the footprint of each type of unit. Uh, the landing areas um, laid out in the product comparison document are on the conservative side um, as usual. So um, in most cases, the, the documentation and the user manuals are on the conservative side. You can be, uh, you would be able to land a unit on a smaller space. Uh, it, it would depend on vessel station keeping and the experience of a crane operator, um, but it would be possible. So moving on, here we have uh, Frog XT6, six people inside being transferred and here you can see uh, how it feels when the unit is fully loaded. So we have uh, full six passengers uh, in the unit. You can see how much space they have and how it feels. You can see that they're seated and they're, they're strapped with safety belts. Um, and I'm just going to quickly walk you through the unit. So uh, the stainless steel frame is clearly visible here and the buoyancy panels on four sides of the unit, protecting from lateral impact if the unit was to slam against anything before um, transfer. So once it's being lifted, if it sways, uh, or once it's landing, uh, if for whatever reason it, it slams against anything, people would be protected. They would feel an impact, but they would uh, be protected. Uh, you can also see uh, shock absorbing feet, uh, blue feet out, uh, underneath each uh, buoyancy panel. Um, they're protecting uh, against vertical impact during landing. And there is also a um, suspension system uh, under each seat, which is protecting uh, during landing against vertical impact. Um, so the sensation would be similar to if the unit was dropped um, from, let's say, half a meter or, or a meter height, the sensation would be uh, as if when you're on an airplane and it lands, so you feel an impact, but uh, your spine and your back are not injured or affected, you are, you are, you are fully protected. Going back to buoyancy, they allow unit to float and self-right when it's in water. So if uh, for whatever reason the unit would uh, drop into water, um, it would float and uh, the water level would be uh, just above uh, the waist of passengers. Uh, if there is a stretcher being transferred, the water level would be underneath the bottom of the stretcher. So the injured person would be above the water level and would be safe until uh, the rescue team comes. If um, hypothetically the unit was uh, to be dropped in the water upside down, which uh, technically can't happen in real life circumstances, but let's say that it can, it would self right in, uh, in uh, approximately three seconds. So if you, um, after the webinar, if you go back to the link that Charlie shared for the uh, testing video, you will be able to see all these tests performed uh, and how the unit performs. 
Um, summarizing now um, the products that some of the products that I've touched and uh, just giving you uh, brief information about some other products. So here is the product portfolio that can uh, be used in offshore operations and then some of them are more suitable for uh, deep water operations than others. On the left hand side we have uh, Frog XT4, 6 and 10 uh, products that I just walked you through and then below we have uh, Wave, I will walk you through that one in a second. We have Stormwork, uh, classic work basket but with improved features this one floats and self rides and has an anti-snagging uh, feature. So in that sense, offers uh, additional protection uh, to people inside when they're doing maintenance and working from height. We have Hawk Deck Motion Monitor system, um, that uh, uh, iPad looking like panel. I'll walk you through that one in a second as well. And then up uh, there on top, uh, the small one is Frog XT2, uh, a two-passenger unit. Uh, this one has been designed and developed particularly for offshore wind industry and um, LNG industry. It, uh, this is the only one from all products that doesn't convert to Medivac mode. So in that sense, we don't recommend it for, um, for deep water and FTSO operations because it doesn't give you the medevac option uh, which we think is quite crucial uh, when you are operating in deep water. So here we have WAVE, uh, four passenger unit. The difference between uh, WAVE and uh, FROG XT4, uh, both being four passenger units, is here the passengers are standing. Uh, so they're not seated, they're standing behind the buoyancy panels and they're looking inside the unit. The red uh, um, basket in the middle is uh, for luggage and then the steel frame uh, on top of that basket is uh, acting also as a stretcher um, a holder when you are converting the unit to medevac mode. So this unit can convert to medevac and can carry one injured person and one paramedic uh, to safety. Uh, it has all the all the features as XT for XT range. So it floats and self rides, protects against vertical and lateral impact. Um, the difference is that uh, people are standing and the operation uh, the operating envelope is slightly lower than for frog XT range. So here we are talking about up to two meters significant wave height. So this one is uh, more suitable for uh, benign regions where the weather is not as moody uh, as in other parts of the world. Uh, deck motion monitor, um, you've seen it on that in, in infographics with, or with, uh, with the product portfolio. Uh, this place, so there are two modules, one is fit, fitted in um, on a vessel, the other one is fitted on a crane. They talk to each other using a uh, wireless uh, local network and uh, they display real-time data. Um, they're easy to install, easy to use, uh, it's a touchpad uh, type of uh, monitor and gives you a clear traffic light system indicating when and where it's safe to lift or land on a deck of a vessel. Uh, it has very low maintenance cost. The software is updated once a year and um, it improves the efficiency of uh, transfers for both crew and cargo. Um, it reduces waiting on weather for up to 50%. On average, it's 30%. So most companies are experiencing up to 30% um, reduction in waiting on weather. Uh, so they can understand when it's safe to lift or land uh, without, um, without much delay. Um, it is used offshore Norway and UK, so in the North Sea offshore India, uh, offshore Canada, and uh, then we also have it offshore 
Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, so in quite a few parts of, of, of the world, different um, operators have decided to use that in an effort to improve their operating envelope and reduce cost. Um, and it has, it has helped them uh, quite a great deal. Uh, one of the one of the useful materials you can find on our website, uh, 10 Golden Rules, um, quite useful for crew uh, who are being transferred, uh, just to give them um, the basic information. Also very useful for crane operator and vessel master uh, as a reminder. Um, on our website, reflexmarine.com, there is a support tab uh, on the home page and if you if you go to the support tab uh, you will get to downloadable section where anything um, that is there you can download for free um, so uh, we share all the materials uh, with everyone who is interested um, in improving their knowledge and understanding of, on how to do safe marine transfer of people offshore um our this is a, just a selection from our client portfolio i've mentioned earlier that we um, have been working and supporting all major uh, operators and their subcontractors um so here's just some of the names equinor shell bp modec um bw offshore cnoc boomi armada tk Petrobras, so all familiar names, um, and of course, their subcontractors um, in different parts of the world. Some of them have our products on every single vessel they have, uh, they are operating, uh, like Modic, for example. Uh, and then the average of um, number of units that uh, super majors have. So uh, companies like BP, Shell, even Equinor, if we consider them as a super major uh, is around 40 so they would have a fleet of 40 40 frogs um, that they would be using for their offshore operations going back to you've already seen these infographics i just wanted to summarize uh, towards the end of the presentation so what kind of support we are offering and uh, quite a lot of that support is is uh, free of charge, like risk analysis and planning, marine crew transfer implementation, operational support, uh, worldwide supporting materials. Those are all free of charge. Um, there are a lot of materials on our YouTube page. If you just Google, if you just, um, sorry, type in the search box when you're on YouTube channel, Reflex Marine, it will take you to our uh, channel and uh, there are loads of videos there that can be quite useful from user briefings to crane operator briefings to how to convert the unit into medevac mode and many other useful materials um, and finally um, to stay a little bit on youtube channel uh, we had this is our fifth uh, i think a webinar in the webinar series that we started doing last year uh, we had a wave webinar um, uh, focusing just on wave as a product um, a couple of weeks ago it's available on our youtube page in case you are interested uh, you can listen uh, to it um, at your convenience and then we have some other webinars uh, one is focusing on lng and another one is focusing on uh, the operations in uh, Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so those might be interesting. Um, next week, we have another webinar coming up uh, focusing on XT10. Uh, but this time, um, it is not going to be a description of the unit and um, the features, the safety features and the operating envelope. Uh, we are going to share um, how companies in West Africa, Caspian, and Asia Pacific are using uh, Frog XT10 uh, in their uh, op operations. So most of these operations are again uh, deep water or FPSO operations. Um, so there will be quite a lot of discussion about how BP is using XT10. Uh, they have a fleet of um, 
10, uh, 10 products at the moment, 10 XT, 10 units at the moment, um, both in West, in, uh, West Africa and in Caspian. And then we'll also touch on Asia Pacific and how FPSO operators over there are using, uh, are using XT10. And that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much for your patience and for um, staying with me while I walk you through the, the, the presentation and all the information we were trying to share. If you have any questions um, right now, I would be more than happy to answer. If you um, have any questions uh, later today or tomorrow or in the future, do drop us an email at info at reflexmarine.com uh, and we'll do our best to provide you with the, with the comprehensible answer. And then I've mentioned our website, reflexmarine.com and our YouTube channel uh, with loads of vid videos that can be quite useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. Goodbye, everyone.